else. Uh, F- Freddie, you, you were saying that the what crop circles and sacred sites had in common. Well, one is that the crop circles were always y- usually found very close to uh, sacred sites. All the time. All the time. And could you explain or define really what a sacred site is? I, 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 there are certain characteristics I know that you talk about that always, there's always water present and. Yeah, I mean, there are um, six features that, that define a sacred site. It has to have the water. Even in the desert in the, the southwest United States, you have a Navajo site where there's water running between two sand dunes. Yeah. That's where their altar is. Um, uh, the, there's a massive amount of water running under the pyramids of Giza in the middle of the desert. Uh, and that's, there's a reason why it's there. It's because that water is energized when it pours through a certain type of rock, usually limestone. It creates a natural electrical charge. The second point is magnetism. All the sacred sites are all located at the crossroads of the Earth's electromagnetic field, uh, what we call the telluric lines, not the ley lines, not the same thing. Uh, and then you have the uh, a, a type of measure which is used to create all the sacred sites in the world called the megalithic yard, and it's derived from the actual motions of the sun, the moon, uh, and also the um, extrapolation between the uh, um, the atom and the tetrahedron that binds atoms together. So it's highly technical. I don't know how they figured this out in the Neolithic era, but it's provable. Then you've got the geometry. Uh, each sacred site is hardwired with a certain geometry. Even if it's invisible to the eye, it will be there. Uh, so you've got all of these elements and you stuck them together and you add your intent to this because every uh, site wasn't just built stacking a bunch of rocks on each other. You have to go there and put your intent into it and you're entering a living being. And in fact, you go towards the east, the further into Polynesia that you go, the more the entrance resembles a mouth of a beast that's about to devour you. And it's a metaphor. It's about the fact that in order to accommodate yourself from profane space into a sacred space, you have to basically devour your physical self. You have to remove yourself from your physical body as much as you can, technically speaking, because you're going to a rarefied world where you have to escape the body to understand the bigger picture. Because the bigger picture, there's much more in the invisible world than exists that is not material. So you have to forget about the physical world. So all of these things conspire to create an environment which cannot be measured, and it has been done by people like Princeton University, uh, going around the Egyptian temples with a specific device that measures the frequency of the temples, and it generates a frequency just by themselves. When you take a person in there with the intent, the, the measurements go way off the scale. So there's an interaction between a site that's been specifically designed to get to have an out-of-body experience, and the crop circles do exactly the same thing. So you go in there with your with the right intent, with at the right moment, uh, extraordinary things happen to you. Uh, pe- I've seen people being changed, healed, uh, and these are skeptics. They go into a, a field of wheat, and uh, they're totally allergic to the stuff, and they'll walk right through the field. They're totally skeptical about crop circles, but they feel compelled to go there. And since then, these people have been healed of whatever afflict, uh, was afflicting them. Um, you can't tell that the skeptics. That doesn't happen to the skeptics. They're already pre-programmed not to believe that, and yet it happens to them. So this is the magic of something that's uh, So it can happen printed. even if you yeah. sense you don't have the intent. I mean, sometimes it can just catch you by surprise. I mean, just, <coughs> just by well, being almost, you know, almost being in a kind of neutral state, I suppose. I think, actually, someone made a very good point about this because it seems to be uh, contradictory. Uh, you know, if you take the fact that if you don't have the right intent, nothing's going to happen. And I believe that is true. And yet we have these people who are, you know, b- uh, who believe solidly that all there is is a physical world. There's no fairies, there's no extraterrestrials, and there's no invisible world. This is all there is. So why would this happen to them? And I would wonder if there's at some point of a subconscious part of yourself that's actually agreed at yeah. some level yeah. to be used as a guinea pig to show other people, other skeptics, that it can even happen to you if you just allow yourself to believe in this. And, this and I thought this a very healthy theory. Absolutely, and that would be very convincing if people know that this person is a very kind of left, left-brained, methodical sort of person, yet yeah. have this experience. 
Yeah, um, I mean, it's like the BBC it's, it's, going into uh, a, a crop circle, and they're very cynical. Yeah. Uh, they're totally. This is how the information gets out about the hoaxing. Yeah. They've got their friends at the BBC and the Daily Mail, especially the Daily Mail, and um, they'll basically because uh, back in the days, the uh, quality media never believed that the crop circles were made by people. I mean, even the Independent said this years ago. They said, "I have more uh, easier time believing in little green men than I do in Doug and Dave making all the world's crop circles." This is a natural quote. And um, so when you have the BBC going into a crop circle, sniggering away, we're going to film these uh, so important, important people who are deluding themselves, the moment they cross the perimeter of the real crop circle, and we've made sure it was a real one where yeah. we're taken to, their wonderful £20,000 camera suddenly went, yeah. uh, have a very agonizing array of uh, warning lights, and yeah. it, it failed to work. And said, you better bring the other camera and keep it outside the circle. And you should see the expression on their faces. And then, and I... I mean, I can't say any more uh, because I'm obviously contradicting uh, a privacy agreement. But uh, the fact is that they would then write back to me in confidential uh, terms in email saying, I think you're onto something. Hands but up. Don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. £20,000, that's, that's a pretty expensive demonstration. <laughs> and, could, could you, and could you explain how the, how the sacred sites, I mean, you know, they're all, you know, having read the books and... and, 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 and Heard, you know, some wonderful interviews that you've done, done with Regina at uh, a guy and so on. Oh yes, yes. You, you, you talk about you know the fact that the the sacred sites are all connected. Yeah. Anyway, um, and is that through the water? Presumably, is that through the through the um, how how are they connected? Uh, several ways. Um, we've just discovered, thanks to NASA, that. Um, there was a wonderful story that goes back to 11,000 uh, BC, at least, in the Vedas of India. They talk about the fact that they're talking about the sacred sites and the fact that they are related to the, uh, the serpents that slide along the ground, which are connected to the serpents in the sky, which are the arrows of sorcerers. Now, a sorcerer is someone who works with the source. In other words, natural forces, and you have control over the natural laws, and you can bend them. And I thought... I wonder if the, what they mean is the fact that they're, they're talking about the Earth's telluric currents that are somehow related to telluric currents that exist outside of the Earth's atmosphere. And would you believe that back in 2009, NASA actually proved this, and they talked about the fact that every uh, 8 minutes or 11 minutes, uh, magnetic portals open between the surface of the Earth and the Sun, and God knows where else, because they've just been discovered going from the Sun to Saturn as well. So that's one of the ways that they're commi- they, they relate. There's these sacred places are connected with these, what they call the reeds of heaven, <coughs> uh, which is the old stories. They yep. all, uh, these reeds that connect to another level of reality. Now we know what they're talking about. They're connected terrestrially by the fact that they're all sitting on the Earth's electromagnetic grid. So like you and I have arteries and blood vessels, and we have puncture points where, you know, for example, in Chinese medicine, they know where to hit the exact node yep. to get problems to move. Yeah. The Earth has the meridian, exactly the meridians and the meridians. Yeah. Yeah. The Earth has exactly the same uh, process because we are a mirror uh, image of the Earth. Yeah. Uh, we have the same geometry in our DNA as the Earth has its own geometry as well. Yeah. Um, so they're connected terrestrially along these invisible lines of force. Uh, and also the water, uh, because uh, the water is part of the concept. Because once you actually begin to interact with the temples and you leave a part of your fingerprint behind, and it should be a good fingerprint, by the way, you should always put a good thought into these things. Yeah. Kind of like going to a holy well, you drink the water and you yeah. feel better. Yeah. And a lot of these heal, like in Cornwall, there's so many healing wells. Yeah. Uh, doctors in London used to send them only 100 uh, years ago, send people from London all the way to Cornwall to get better. Yeah. So obviously it worked. Uh, in a way, you're drinking the memory and the prayers of people that have gone before you. And that memory goes into the water, it goes into the aquifer, and it recharges all the wells and the earth itself. That's why the old people had a connection with the earth, and they want to maintain that connection. Because if you maintain the spirit of the earth in balance, then we are in balance with it. Again, new age concept, but very true. We can now prove this. Like Masuro Emoto in Japan, he Absolutely. proved that you take two vials of the same water, you have one person writing on it with strong intent, I'm going to kill you, and the other one is, I love you, and you put the two crystalline structures side by side, the two crystal patterns are totally different, one's totally chaotic, the other one is totally organic. So, again, the power of intent mixed in with the water, mixed in the electromagnetism, you've got that connection. So, it's actually very simple when you think about it. It takes 25 years to understand. And does that tie in at all with kind of Rupert Sheldrake's morphic 
fields, morphic resonance? Is that, is that, that comes into the equation as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We're part of this big organism. And uh, in fact, I was having this conversation the other day with uh, a radio station about the fact that uh, if we connect uh, and find our purpose, not just within ourselves, because any Indian would say, well, you don't need sacred spaces to find yourself and connect to the bigger picture to the morphic field. You are the temple. I mean, even Jesus Christ said this, the temple of God resides within you. He wasn't joking. He was an honorary Buddhist. Well, and I was going to say, when the Buddhists say that if you see the Buddhists walking down the street, it basically kill him. Because actually, it's actually the, the point being is that the, the Buddha is in with you. Is in with exactly. Yourself, you know? yeah. we, we are the temple. We have the same magnetic structure. We have all the water we need. We have the intents. We have the geometry. We already are the temple. You don't need that stuff. But if you don't, you go to the temple. Um, and basically, if you are able to connect and find a way to connect with the bigger picture, there are so many people like us who are also connecting with the bigger picture, and that creates a change. Yeah. And there's more people doing this around the world than we're actually given credit for, because, you know, good news doesn't make the headlines. You really hear about this stuff. And, I mean, I go to, uh, I mean, I live in America now. Um, it, there are conservative pockets, of course. Uh, one is in Ohio, but would you believe one of my biggest... Uh, sections of my mailing list is in Ohio. I have gone to places you've never heard of. I've never heard of. Well, let me ask you a place. I used to live in a place called Chillicothe in Ohio for a time. I know it well. Do you know it? Really? Yeah. Um, and um, I was really annoyed that I never got to see the serpents. The serpents. Oh. But I, I know. I, I, I didn't know about it at the time. But, but sorry, you were going, going back to Ohio. You were saying the people there... Um... Oh, I found uh, packed rooms. I'm talking about a couple of hundred people suddenly packed into a room that came out of the woodwork uh, to learn about this stuff. So for me, it's actually quite uh, enchanting to find that we're actually the, mi the majority, not the minority. There's more people trying to think of a better world, a better way to create society, and we're having that resonant effect. It's, it's When you pay too much attention to what's happening in the media, and it's not the media's fault. I mean, they have to make money, they have to you know, sens sensationalize things, but um, and inevitably it's the uh, the weird things that get on the front page. So are, um, we, all, are we all like, sorry, Freddie, that, I just thought of something, that are we all, in a sense, like the, the Hopi or the Lakota would be, we're all basically crying for a vision, aren't we? We're all, we all want we all want to partake in in something. Yeah. Some of us don't know quite how to go about it, and it's, it's you know it requires a lot of courage to open yourself up and take that Absolutely. first step to visit a you know to take to undertake this journey. I mean, you would know more than than anybody, and and but it's it's really interesting to hear that you can go to a back pocket in Ohio and, and find yeah. people who obviously surprise you to an extent that a lot of people actually are resonating to to this message. Oh, absolutely absolutely and it shows that you know that more people like us uh, who are coming up with the same vision and uh, we're able to actually have a change in fact i'm actually quite confident that we're having so much chaos right now in the world because it shows that we're actually having an effect because it shows that the old order is afraid they're afraid they're going to lose their livelihoods their their power base this is why there's so much reaction going on now from the ultra-right. Yes. We're seeing an effect, cause and effect, caused by more people shining the light on things, and it creates a knee-jerk reaction. And we're going to have to go through this. That's how physics works, by the way. Uh, in order to go from one level of order to another level of order, you have to have chaos in between the two. But, yes. and any physicist will know this, the greater the amount of chaos, the greater the potential jump to another level of order. Yes. So if, if we're now hearing about horrors being committed in the Middle East, and people People pouring people, uh, acid on people's faces in London and so forth. It happens all the time. It's happened throughout history all the time. This is not new. Yeah. But the fact is you're seeing these breakdowns in civilization, and it's actually a sign that we're actually about to have enough in order to be able to make the jump to another level of reality. It's actually quite a positive step in the right direction. And which if we're living in quiet times, I'd be worried we weren't doing our job properly. Yes. I mean, I mean do you, you know? see from that, from that perspective, and do you see that somebody like Trump is, you know, is, is basically just, you know, is just a manifestation of our, everyone's shadow anyway. So he's, he's, actually, he's actually, you know, doing a service, really, because he's, Catalyst, he's, yeah. he's offering us something. To, so we can define what we don't want. Yes. And you know what I mean, and it gives us permission almost to look for alternatives. To we, we, you know, we define ourselves by what we don't want to be in a way, and that creates exactly. Some and that's how humans usually are, unfortunately. I mean, yeah. things. Are, I mean, think, uh, um, humans change in glacial terms. I mean, it takes. 
I mean, it's like you and I saying, um, okay, the council comes around and they're going to force you out of your house because they have to knock down your house because they're going to build a road. I mean, you hold to that reality with tenaciousness. You want to protect your turf. You don't want things to change. We like our, our constants. Uh, so in order to get humans to move to another level of reality, it takes a long time to, to happen. And sometimes you need to shock people into doing things. Um, sometimes you have to have, you know, 30,000 people, and that, I'm not talking about a bigger picture here, um, and removing your emotion from, from the event, which is very difficult. Um, 35,000 people suddenly die in a tidal wave in Indonesia. It's horrible. There's loss of life. Now, if you could just step back a little bit and see the big, big, big picture, what happened? Um, if you accept the fact that we come here with a purpose, and some of us come here to be leaders, some come here to be victims, some come here to show others how not to do things, then you accept that 35,000 people at some level would have given up their life to show others something bigger. And the bigger thing that happened was all these governments promoted the idea that we're going to give Indonesia billions in, uh, of money in aid. Not one of that penny ever reached the islands. The money that got to the Indonesia was from donations from people like you and me. It brought the whole world together and suddenly realized and showed all of us we're actually much more connected as a family than we would have accepted if that hadn't happened. <clears throat> but it, sometimes it, it takes something so shocking to happen to judge people out of their uh, complacency and recognize that we're actually much more connected. So someone like Trump. Um, he's actually shining a light on those people who are holding on to some really negative stuff. I mean, I'm surrounded by this every single day here. You have to kind of just, you know, have a good pint and continue. Uh, but you know what? In about three months from now, I can almost put money on the fact that the people who have been supporting him have, have realized they've been duped. And they are very angry people. And it's going to create a big backlash. It's going to get really ugly. And that will help wake people up to the fact that, wait a minute. There were these people over here that were telling us another way of doing things, which is actually, now that we see what's happened here, is much better. And they'll probably gravitate towards that center. So sometimes that has to happen in order to get people to move forward. It's just the way things are historically with the human race. Yes. I would prefer the gentler way, but sometimes yeah. there's a group of people that just need to be hit over the head a little bit to get them to move. <laughs> I mean, what would be wonderful? Would you have a field day with us? Yes, <laughs> it would be great to be able to get sort of you know Kim Jong Un, Donald Trump, um, and you know I don't know two or three others. You know, add, add they've never been seen together. Add, add a yeah. sacred <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Another conspiracy. That's it. Um, and they're all, not they're weird hair. They're all the same. They're all the same person. <laughs> and um, but if you're able to bring them together in in a I don't know in a church cathedral or somewhere that was a you know there was a power point to a sacred place I mean that yeah. would that would be very interesting wouldn't it I mean if if as opposed to being in a sort of G8 room stuck in some exactly. I mean, or G20 somewhere I mean they'd have to take that sort of leap of faith you'd probably have to hijack them all and you know and plot them, plot them there but, exactly. But, um, yeah, know. take them somewhere like Avery Stone Circle or uh, one of my favourite places. I, I, I'm in Scotland, up in the middle of nowhere, Kalanish, uh, one of the most unpolluted sacred sites in the world. I mean, if you didn't think you were psychic, you will be when you get there. You can hear the stones talking back to you. It's like a family. Um, I would put them somewhere that is so clear, so clean. Um, even in the Andes, there are temples there which are so powerful, uh, mostly because of the altitude as well. But uh, the resonance of the stone and the geometry is such that uh, you can hear things talking in your ear that it changes you as soon as you actually step inside them. Uh, that would be a great idea. In fact, there are videos of me talking at uh, places like Saksai, Waman, and Cusco, and you can see that I'm having a real trouble concentrating on what I'm saying because I can hear all this conversation going on in my left ear, and I'm going, I hope I can remember this information because it's really good. And I'm trying to do a talk at the same time. And yeah. then once we, we finish, I take out my little book and I write the information down. I think, this is interesting. And then I do the research and find out what I just heard is absolutely true. I can back that up now. Yeah. So that's how these places do work. They're very magical. The, uh, the, the other, uh, I mean, I suppose this ties in also, um, Freddie, with you know the ring stones in South Africa with Michael Tellinger and so on, isn't it? Oh, yeah, this, yeah. This is, this is, this I is had here the other day. Did you? <laughs> really? Yeah, from South Africa. It shows up in Maine, of all places. You're kidding. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and that starts pulling all this together, too, isn't it, for the sacred sites 
um, yes. that, that you know we're bring, bringing sound into this again, aren't we? That sound seems to be uh, an ingredient. Oh, that, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a big history in Northern Europe, uh, England, and uh, Northern France, for example, of the uh, fairy mounds or the the giant graves, as we call them, yeah. long barrows, we call them in England. Uh, huge association with sound. In fact, one of the first things that you do when you approach a sacred site properly is to you know check yourself, make sure you leave all your mental garbage at the door. You don't want to take your negativity in there because uh, you kind of pollute the place. And you walk around a few times, just either humming, singing or doing something with sound, some bells, anything, just to energize the spirit of place. And I always wanted to find out what it was all about. And it turns out that the Egyptians used to do the same thing in their temples too. Oh, really? They used to, the priests used to go into each room of the temples, uh, you know, 5,000, 8,000 years ago, and they used to uh, um, sing and hum tunes into each temp a portion of the temple as though they are waking a person from slumber. It turns out, now that we have the mechanism which to measure this uh, mumbo-jumbo with, is that actually, just before sunrise, the uh, frequency of electromagnetism coming out of the sun on the horizon, it's at its highest. It's also the same moment when plants are also at their most receptive state. Right. And knowing now what we know about the organic nature of the temples, it's actually the frequency of the temples is at a point, uh, <coughs> excuse me, just... Just before the sun crosses the perimeter of the horizon, which is actually a, a hieroglyph in Egypt, that's when the uh, local electromagnetic field suddenly gets drawn to the entrance of the sites and it whirls around them and suddenly the sun crosses the perimeter and all the electromagnetic frequency shoots in through the entrance. It happens every dawn at Avebury, by the way, in, in Wiltshire. Yeah. And it's been measured uh, with electro, uh, electric equipment. Uh, the energy goes in sometimes twice the level of the local frequency. So you're sitting there and you're getting this whoop of energy behind you, and the sight literally awakens from a slumber. So the Egyptians were correct. I mean, you put in your energy and your and your voice. Yeah. You're giving it an intent, yeah. uh, and you basically uh, ally with the energy of place, which is by its design and its geometry, it too is designed certain sonic frequencies. So. Chandra Cathedral is a great example. The walls, the relationship of the pillars are done just so to create certain mathematical formulae yeah. which generate musical notation and um, to create a certain effect in the viewer. And um, people have found, I think there's the Russians who did this years ago, they put people in the Gothic cathedrals when they were very quiet and they measured their brainwave frequencies and they said, uh, let's put some Gregorian music in the building because that was the kind of pop music that was used back then, specifically for the, for the buildings. And uh, they found that when you put Gregorian chant into the Gothic cathedrals and you put a person upright in the nave, your brainwaves go 4,000% above normal waking state. That's a, what's called a hallucinatory experience, or if you want to put it in religious terms, connecting with the mind of God. Uh, so these people knew exactly what they, they were doing. So... So if we were to try and create sort of world peace in one evening, you'd bring together some of these world leaders, put them in shot cathedral, and have that wonderful Ravi Shankar story that that uh, that you <laughs> talked about before. I mean, just just that it's the same thing, isn't it? It's the same principle, I suppose. Isn't it? It's sacred music, sacred tones, sacred sounds, exactly. and, and and has the same effect as you were talking about with. Um, and what's the first phrase that happens in every single religious text around the world? In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word created the universe. In fact, the Egyptians actually never differentiated sound from light. They said in their version of the Bible, which precedes the Bible by thousands of years, in the beginning, Ra emitted a cry of light. And, you've, and I always wondered about that. Well, how would he emit a cry of light? Unless the two are simultaneous. Well, of course they are. That's our perception, because we are limited beings in physical, we separate light and sound. Well, in the laboratory in Princeton, they said, actually, that's not quite true. If you take audible sound and you put it into a certain tube and you ramp it exactly 40 octaves above the human hearing range, that sound generates something called sonoluminescence. They actually get a flash of light. So the Egyptians were right. Creation is based on the simultaneous effect of sound and light. The two are not uh, separate. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's, no, it's, it's just amazing, isn't it? Um, one question I had from a friend of mine, she, she wanted to know 
because uh, I put out the word that I was going to be interviewing you. Is it possible to create your own sort of sacred space? Oh, God, I, yeah. I, I, I know for a fact that Freddie knows all about that because that's part of the work <laughs> that you do. But but it is, I mean, and quite quite yeah. easily, quite you know, in, in very easily. Yeah, yeah it, it actually, asked the same question years ago, and uh, after going to so many of the sites and sitting there quietly and letting talking back to you, uh, it's amazing how much you can pick up. And I thought, what if you can't get to the site? What if? Yeah. Can you bring the temple to you? And again, by this wonderful magic, the information starts coming back at me and saying, look at the basics. Look at the basics. I mean, the basics of the big, oh, well, how temples are built. And so I finally figured out that every temple is based on seven laws, and I hardwired them into <coughs> excuse me, uh, a full-day workshop where I actually teach people uh, to create their own temple. With their I, own saw, I saw that, yes. Yeah. It's the uh, uh, one-day temple so, workshop. Yeah, yeah temp uh, temple building is a DVD that's actually based on the workshop. If people can't make the workshop and they can't afford it, so all the materials in there, you can watch two DVDs and go, oh, that's easy. Uh, of course, it takes you 30 years to figure out how easy it is, but once you do it, it's like, oh, actually, it's really simple when you think about it. So right now, where I'm phoning from, I am sitting in the middle of downtown Portland, um, in the middle of a city, I have two energy lines running through the building. There's a masculine one here, feminine one behind me, and I'm sitting in the middle of a temple. And you can't tell because the stones are so carefully hidden. Uh, you don't need big stones unless you're a Virgo or an Aries. You have to show yourself to be, you know, look at how big my stones are. You can use small crystals that big. You can put them in the middle of bookshelves, and people will come in here, and they'll feel there's something unusual about this, this building, my apartment, and they'll sit exactly in the one place where all the things come inside. You can sit anywhere you want, but they always go for exactly the same hot spot. What kind of crystals are amazing? I mean, uh, what kind of crystals do you um, use? I use? I use quartz because I just happen to like it, uh, because it's the neutral go-to um, thing, but there are certain rocks that you can choose which are masculine or feminine. It depends on whether they come from a volcano or they come from the action of water. And you look at the temples and you think, why is this temple dedicated to this deity? It's a female deity. Now, that's funny. They use exactly the same type of stones in the same temples dedicated to the same feminine principle. Oh, of course, that makes sense. Uh, stones which are born from the action of water. Water is flowing. It's fluid. It succumbs to the actions of the moon. The moon is considered feminine. Oh, okay, that's why they use feminine stones in feminine temples. But you go to a masculine site and you go, and it feels very different. It's like whales full of masculine sites. They're very rigid. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, they use volcanic stone. Of course, volcanic is the action that's based on the metaphor of the sun. It's volcanic. Right. It's bl it blasts out energy like a masculine energy is. It comes in your face. Yeah. So you want that to bear in your actual temple. And if you want both of them, if you want a balanced site, like a lot of Gothic cathedrals are balanced, you have the pillars, like Salisbury, it has the granite pillars, but then you've also got sandstone and limestone. Yeah. And the two together create a balanced environment. Pyramid in Egypt, same thing. Yeah. Granite on the inside, limestone on the outside. An electrical engineer will look at this and say, well, yes, you're causing a, uh, a res resistivity in the two currents. You're creating a, a highly energized electrical circuit. So there is a method to all of this, not is, just symbolic. Is, is that why we're attracted to some places and not others? That we actually literally do exactly. resonate. We literally resonate differently with, with places. Exactly. It depends on what you're looking for and where you are in life. You know, all of us are our own little radio stations. Uh, there are sites. I remember one time when I was learning all of this years ago, I'd go to the Devil's Den uh, in Wiltshire. It's, uh, one of the oldest sacred sites in Britain that no one even knows where it is. Uh, not much left of it. Uh, so it's a, it looks like a big dolmen now. It used to be a giant's grave. And I remember going in there, crossing the field, and I heard a big voice saying, you really shouldn't be coming in here. And I turned around, and I thought the farmer had nicked me. And I thought, well, there's no farmer around, but I definitely heard, you know, and I cocked my leg over the uh, uh, the gate, and I said, you really should not, you are not ready to come anywhere near this. And I went, holy mother, yeah. I just got the hell out of there. Anyway, drove up the uh, couple of miles away and went to see a good friend of mine who's a very good psychic. And uh, I just sat down for a cup of tea. I didn't say anything. She says, have you just been to the devil's den? I said, how do you know that? I said, I know everything. I said, yeah, you do, actually. I said, well, did you get a voice telling you not to go in? I said, 
Yes. Well, it's because you don't yet understand the full concept of energy. You are of a certain frequency. That's a very powerful site. Was this, was this sort of 10, 15 years ago before you... This is about, yeah, about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Right. A long time ago. Yeah. And so, until you understand what you're actually messing with, you, you should understand that like attracts like, but also if you're of a certain type of energy and you've got another type, you can create dissonance yes. and you'll destroy everything that you've done for yourself. Yeah. Learn what you're doing, yeah. go back in a few years and see what happens. And I did. A couple of years later, I learned a bit more and I thought, okay, I've got that wrong, I've got that right. Yeah. Now I can appreciate this like what it is. And I went there with the right uh, uh, attitude and it was like this carpet, this red carpet just went out and said, ah, oh, welcome. And you feel it, it's like a door yes. that opened it. Well, that's a bit different, and you've learned. You've now realized another initiation, level. another right of yeah. message. Yeah, you know. and then you think you know it all, and then something else happens that shows you you don't know it all yet. Yeah. And it, it's constant. I mean, I've been doing this for so long now, and I think I know so much, and yet I know so little. Uh, every time I sit down to write something new, it's like I thought I knew it all, and I still don't know enough. Do you have?